Hello, my name is Charlie and I am the host of the Mage System. This is my second time trying to film this video and it's just not going well because it's kind of a hard video to film for some reason. Well, I'm gonna get kind of personal in it. Uh, so I've just gone with the strategy of just chilling the hell out and not trying to be so technical with how I talk about this. So sorry if it's boring, but I'm just going to talk in whatever direction I want to talk in. Um, I told y'all at some point or another that I was going to college right now and I'm going to get a doctorate in psychology one day. I'm going to be a big man. Uh, but I never told y'all why. Uh, I'd like to do research, honestly. There's a lot we need to do research on, especially in trauma and dissociation. But within that, uh, there's a lot about DID that it's insane that we've not researched to me. Because if we've got a disorder so freaking fantastical seeming that, like, you know, so many people don't think it's real, then there's a lot you could do with that. Especially, like, case study-wise. Not that I want to poke and prod ourselves like animals, but, like, it's nuts that your sexuality and gender can just change like that. Less so with gender, because gender fluid people exist, but, like, it's insane that a gay man and a lesbian can exist in the same brain. Um... <laughs> Uh, God, I don't know where this video is going. I didn't take my ADHD meds today, so I just really don't know how this is gonna go. It's second time filming, so. Uh, essentially, um, <laughs> to make a long story short, I shoved the whole bag of jelly beans. No, oh, uh, trick or warning, uncensored swearing, by the way. So, um, I just wanted to talk about DID and gender, I guess. Uh, not only the fact that you can have multiple genders in one head, but also just the way DID and trauma affects your perception of your gender. Because to define gender for you, you know, people, it's not what's between your legs. People used to think you had pink brains and blue brains, and then you, if you had a pink brain and a blue body or a blue brain and a pink body, then you'd be trans. But that's not really how it works. Uh. Not really. It, gender, it's just your psychological perception of yourself, really. People really want to know so bad why people are trans, but recently I've kind of thought about it and I've thought, maybe it's just not that fucking complicated. Like, maybe it's literally just that your perception of yourself is different from your body. And that just fucking happens sometimes. Like, why is there gotta be a huge, like, chemical answer here? Like, why does it have to be so biological, you know? It just happens sometimes. I don't know. <laughs> um... I am the host of the mage system, and I'm also a series of integrated alters, so I wasn't the first host. I've also had experience being a girl, being a boy, and being non-binary. I've had experience being all of those things because I am a series of integrated alters that were all of those things. Uh, my name is Charlie. Um, I call myself a guy, I use he, they pronouns, but if I had to choose one word for my gender identity, it would be genderqueer. Uh, I 99% of the time think of myself as a guy, even if I'm wearing a skirt, I just picture myself like a gender non-conforming guy. And uh, the only situations in which I perceive myself like a girl is in, you know, situations if I'm like dating a girl, I'm not down for that straight shit, you know what I mean? <laughs> and I don't have that much dysphoria in those situations, or not that much in general nowadays, but, uh, in those situations I don't. So I perceive myself like a girl a lot of times in romantic situations, because I just don't know. I, I, it just doesn't work with the guy thing. I don't really know how to describe it. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there are a few situations, or when I start getting, like, triggered, sometimes I'll go into girl mode a little bit. I don't know, kind of like as a defense mechanism. I don't really know how to describe it. You know, like sometimes whenever people with trauma talk like a kid whenever they get triggered and they're not necessarily in little space, but it's kind of like a defense mechanism of like, don't hurt me. You know what I mean? Um, but 99% of the time, I'm a guy. And that's just a little example of the way trauma can kind of affect your gender identity is I'm a guy, but sometimes I turn into a girl as a coping mechanism. And if I'm being completely dead honest and vulnerable with you guys, maybe even sometimes in romantic situations, when I've, like, gotten in an argument or felt threatened, um, sometimes people with a lot of trauma will use sex as a coping mechanism of, if I can, if I can make you, if I can tame you and I can make up with you sexually, then I will keep myself safe. Which I never, 
I don't think I ever had that, but maybe sometimes the girl thing can be kind of like that too, of like, I'm just a girl, you know? And the kind of stereotype of that aside, you know, like, that's something you learn as a kid, kind of, if you feel threatened. But, uh, I wanted to talk about it. I've had a lot of integrations over the years, but the there's a couple that actually changed my gender identity. So, originally, the base me, the first one, I guess, that was around that integrated was before integration. The first one was L, spelled E-L-E. She was a girl. She was a she-her. Uh, she was around in, like, teenagerhood. I don't know if she was the first host. I don't think so, but I can't remember for the life of me. Like, if I think back to my childhood, none of it feels like me, to be honest, and I don't know. I just don't know, and I'm just so tired of thinking about it, but, um, Elle was a girl, and I'm gonna get pretty personal with you here, and not talk about just the way trauma affects your gender, but, you know, the way trauma affects your perception of your body, and it's kind of hard to talk about, but I gotta talk about it, because it's interesting, and it's important, and I don't mind, I guess, but, I have coffee here for grounding, so. So. When Elle was about 13, Elle isolated herself from school, and she started doing homeschool, um, because she started getting really depressed and, like, really dissociated all the time, and she thought that school was the problem. So she left to do online school, essentially isolating herself from everybody. And though school was a problem, like, people were terrible, isolating myself was an interesting choice that I don't regret because it got me where I am now and I learned a lot. But I also almost died, (laughs) you know? Um, Anyways, um, around that time, Elle was still unaware of any childhood trauma. Elle held middle school trauma, but... Elle didn't think we had any childhood trauma, and so, um, that was that. But around the time she started isolating herself, um, she started wearing, like, this big black hoodie all the time. And it wasn't- the main reason wasn't because they were insecure- I mean, she was insecure about her body. Um, that wasn't the main reason. It was- Damn, I'm dissociating- Um, I think, I think I was insecure about my body, but I think the main thing was that I didn't want to be sexualized, especially, like, if I'm being dead honest with you guys, like, especially around my family, like, I'd wear, like, a massive black hoodie because I just didn't want to be sexualized, but I didn't understand why. I didn't understand why I did that. I just knew I couldn't not do that because I would just be disgusted with myself. And the main reason I'm telling you all this is for the fucking trauma survivors out there who understand what I'm talking about when I say some of this stuff. Because, honestly, my biggest goal here is not only to educate the singlets and non-trauma survivors, but also to just make the trauma survivors feel less alone. Because we often say we have trauma, but we don't talk about it the way it affects us. Because it's hard to talk about and it feels icky, but it's kind of necessary. Because if you don't talk about it, I mean, I'm not pressuring you, but I will. If you don't talk about it, then these other trauma survivors think that yours must be a lot more mysterious and scary than theirs is, and theirs is not valid. But once you start talking about it, you'll start realizing we have a lot of common ground here. These icky feelings, they're among both of us. (laughs) Anyways, um, Elle was insecure for a long time. Elle just, Elle started consuming, um trans guy content on YouTube, not because she was thinking about being trans, not because I wanted to be trans at all, or because I thought I was trans. I just genuinely just have an interest in a lot of different things, and gender was really interesting to me, so I was just researching it. There wasn't anything trans about it, but there was at one point, and this, uh, this is a story of Max breaking off, which was a boy who, since integrated, he was a very big prominent alter in our system until he integrated into me making Charlie. But he has a Meet the Alters video on it. Like, the integration happened, like, two months ago. But he was a big... He, he played a big role in our system. But this is a story of him breaking off. As Elle was 14, and she was watching one, like, video of a couple trans guys talking about their transition and stuff like that. And it's a really bad point in Elle's life. And suddenly, something, like, 
clicked or shifted in my head. And I went to my room. <laughs> and this is funny as hell. I downloaded Face App. <laughs> You know the one where you, like, take a picture of yourself and it, like, shows you as, like, an old person? <laughs> that, I downloaded a fucking face app. And, um, I, I look, I turned myself into a boy. And then I looked at the picture. Speaking as Max here, <laughs> I was breaking off big time. I looked at the picture as Max and I was like, aw, oh, fuck. <laughs> I was like, god damn. I think I'm a boy. <laughs> and then I remember crying as Max, crying like a little fucking baby because I was like, shit, I'm a boy. And real talk here, talking as Elle and Max at the same time, why did my subconscious do this? Why did my brain do this? Because I was wanting to cover up my body and I wasn't allowed to know about why. I wasn't allowed to know about why I was doing that as a coping mechanism because then I know about the sexual trauma and I knew about the sexual trauma, but I just completely never thought about it and never thought it was anything and just thought, oh, like that little fucking embarrassing thing. Like we don't talk about that. <laughs> like I just hadn't thought about it in years, but it stays under the surface and it creeps in and it fucks shit up, you know, and you don't realize it until later <laughs> when everything's already fucked up. Um, but I didn't know why I was doing that, and I think my brain was consuming this trans guy content, and my subconscious was like, Ayo, I got an idea. If we- She doesn't know why she's doing this, but if we could make this more bite-sized, if L were only a guy, this would be so much easier. You know, you wouldn't have to approach these social situations with a fear of being sexualized. And this would all make so much more sense to you. And so I, as Max, broke off as a result. So not only was I a coping mechanism to make the jacket thing and, like, the one, the hating your body shit seem more, like, make more sense to me. But it was also a way of explaining or protecting myself in social situations and, like, yeah, a lot of it was sexual trauma, but being a girl is hard because you feel like everybody's looking at you all the time. And I've said this before in the everybody is non-binary video, but being a girl is hard because it feels like everyone's looking at you all the time. And I think my brain at that time was just like, I'm so fucking sick of this shit. <laughs> and so therefore Max split off and he was kind of a protector in a way because, um, he could go out, he would often go out in social situations and be like, hey, what's up, what's going on? And he'd be comfortable, he'd be perfectly comfortable when Elle was uncomfortable. And, but beyond that, he also had trauma. Like, I had trauma. I had pseudo-memories of a life before being in the headspace. Um, I grew up in Canada. <laughs> I feel, like, I still feel dumb talking about it, but I do have memories of being like, a life before coming here, and, uh, I have, where I was consistently perceived as a guy, and, uh, what the fuck else, where was I going with that? I have a lot of trauma, like, I had self-harmed and I had eating disorders and stuff like that, and, uh, I have a video describing my life before coming into the headspace and my pseudo-memories as Max, if you want to watch that, if I remember, I'll link it below, but I might not remember knowing me, so, uh, yeah. I split off. And then a bunch of confusion in ensued because we don't have a whole lot of amnesia. And because of that, um, that's going to lead to Elle being very confused about her gender because why the fuck is she a dude named Max sometimes? You know what I mean? Um, because my name was Max back then. Because I was like, I'm trans. I got to pick out a name. And if you look on my birth certificate in fucking Canada that doesn't exist, it's Sam. My name is Sam. And uh, whenever we found out we had DID and I presented myself and was like, hey, I'm here, guys. I'm a real, I'm a real boy. <laughs> the, though my trans guy name was going to be Max, um, brain, work. Um, they, it just, Sam just kept slipping out of people's mouths. It was like that was meant to be my name. 
Which makes sense because there was a TV character around that time that was very prominent named Sam that, that's very similar to who I am. Um, but, uh, sheesh. Sorry if this is boring, by the way. Anyways, um, so that caused a bunch of confusion. And then around the time Elle was 15, still very isolated, um, a lot of Elle's freedom was taken away. And as a coping mechanism, the brain split off another altar. And this altar was called Nico. And Nico was a masculine lesbian, or kind of an androgynous lesbian, like, if you know what Shane from the L word looks like, or, like, Nana from the anime Nana, Nana, the, the cool one who sings and shit, um, that's kind of the vibe that Nico had, like, she was this kind of, like, deadpan space cadet, like, masculine, like, she was cool, right? Um, and very gay, and she was a pretty sexual person, too. Um, she split off, and she was kind of protectorish, but she was also very angry. She never projected that anger on other people, and if she did, it was very sarcastic and deadpan. But she would, she would listen to a lot of metal music, and she would make music like that, too. And, uh, her and Elle actually were, like, kind of co-hosting around that time, because they were really similar. Not really similar, but they just, I don't know, they just worked well together. But, um, Nico split off, and then I'll tell you the story of Elle and Nico's integration, because this is where the real party starts, and this is where my gender identity starts getting really fuzzy. So, <laughs> Nico integrated the first time I ever had a romantic kiss with somebody, when I was fucking 14, or no, I was 15. When I was 15, <laughs> the first time I ever kissed a girl in a romantic way, and not just a, oh, let's do this, kind of way, you know, um, it was an insane experience, first of all, I, I liked it <laughs> at the time, uh, and, uh, but that night, I could tell something had changed, and I had figured out I had DID then, I knew there was something up now, and, um, uh, when I woke up the next morning, I was like, hey, I think Nico's gone. <laughs> and then Nico integrated, thus creating a new altar. That altar was called L, spelt just the letter L. And I've been using L with the word she this whole time, so I might slip up, but L's gender identity changed. L began to identify as non-binary. But there, a lot of things happened when Nico integrated. Number one being that L became a whole lot more, like, a lot of L's anxiety went away, and L became a whole lot more impulsive. And it was almost like, it was almost like I didn't even have to think about it. I was just like, oh yeah, I'm not a girl anymore. Even though I still dressed like a girl and all that, I was just like, I didn't even, like, think about it. Like, usually, like, if L were, were, before integration were to have a crisis like that, she would be really having a crisis. But once Nico integrated, I was just like, I do whatever the fuck I want. I ain't even a girl, dude. <laughs> so, um, yeah, I started identifying as non-binary. And, uh, there was almost some kind of fluidity to it, because I would dress like a boy sometimes and dress like a girl sometimes. Um, I became a lot more goth. Um, I was really struggling around the time Nico integrated with my eating disorder. And so, it's hard to really pinpoint a lot of how I thought about stuff during that time, because my brain was just a pit of starving static, and, uh, I honestly can't remember a lot from that time, because I was just so malnourished, but, um, should I have trigger warned that? I'm sorry if I should have, but, um, anyways, fast forward to when Max integrated a couple months ago. I started identifying as a guy after that happened, which if you want to know how that happened, I've already explained it, like, a few times, but, um, you can hear about it in the Meet the Alters Charlie video and the Max's Last Words Before Fusion video or the My Alter Fusion video. Anyways, who cares? I feel annoying right now. 
Anyways, um, it's been a couple months ago, but it's like the integration is still settling in. It's like my identity becomes more cohesive by the day, and my experience of my gender becomes more cohesive by the day. I was pretty certain I was a guy when I integrated, you know, like, I felt like a guy, but then sometimes it would switch and I would just be, like, not feeling like a guy very much because I wanted to dress femininely. And I've been slowly more and more figuring it out by the day, but I think where I'm at now with that is that I think I'm a guy the vast majority of the time, but I think sometimes I have a lot of gender nonconformity to me, and, um kind of fucking embarrassing but recently i've been looking a lot into like femboy stuff you know because it's kind of cool to me it's kind of cool and it's kind of freeing because i thought like if i'm dressing in these skirts and stuff then how the fuck am i supposed to still view myself as a guy in a way and i think i realized wait a second i can just be a boy in a skirt kind of nuts right and uh but the thing about it that's hard for me where trauma kind of comes in and messes with it is because though I do really love femboy culture, it is so closely and affiliate, like really closely linked with sexual stuff and like sexualizing feminine boys. It's like, I can't separate the cultures because if I look on TikTok and I look at femboy TikTok, like one third of the TikToks are going to have like some sort of sexual innuendo in them or something, you know, because there's such a strong culture on sexualizing femboys that is really closely linked with like the fashion and stuff like that. And uh, I guess that's fine. Like if you want to make a sexual femboy TikTok, go off, sir. But I can't like that's all right. And there's really no solution. Like I don't have like I'm not complaining about what the boys are doing because they're just doing what they want to do. But it just does suck for me because I really resonate with them boys, but it's like, I just don't want to be sexualized and I don't want to feel sexual all the fucking time whenever I'm dressed in a skirt, you know what I mean? I want to think, I don't want to think about myself that way all the time because then I start feeling, getting that icky feeling, you know, that sexual trauma residue feeling where you're like, I don't want to be sexualized all the fucking time. It's not just, like, normal I don't want to be sexualized all the time. It's like you feel gross about yourself. And, um, it really sucks sometimes because I really, really enjoy it. But it's just so closely linked with that. And I don't even know what I'm talking about at this point. And I don't know how weird this is to listen to, but you're just hearing my stream of consciousness at this point. Um... I wouldn't even be opposed to viewing being a femboy in kind of a sexual way when there's a time and place to do that, but it's just so normalized in everyday life that when femboy co mode comes on, it's a sexual thing for a lot of people, and it's just, like, not that way for me. It's kind of, like, the antithesis of that for me. It's, like, this freedom, but I don't know. I just don't like how sexualized it is sometimes. But I guess I'm just a feminine boy a lot of times. Sometimes I'm pretty masculine, but a lot of times I'm pretty feminine. I'm wearing a skirt right now and some thigh highs. <laughs> uh, I, I'm feeling pretty, pretty good right now, kind of. I mean, I feel... <sighs> I don't know how I fucking feel. I feel like this video is a little dumb and it's not very good, but I don't know. You're going to watch it anyway. Like, I feel like it's not very interesting and people are going to click off pretty soon, but to be honest, I don't even care at this point. Like, what am I even doing? <laughs> Who cares if people watch my videos? <laughs> like, what, do, what is this? What am I doing? I hope my employers never see this. <laughs> um, it's fine. <laughs> My name is Mac. My name is not Max anymore. I mean, you can call me that, I guess. But, uh, my name is... I almost said Sam. I, I don't even know my name anymore, dude. My name is Charlie. <laughs> Charlie, out. 